feel like something is missing in your marriage, we have an unbelievable show today. Really, don't do anything else. Turn, on, turn everything else off and come and sit and watch the show. We are talking about the soul of marriage. Stay tuned. Leia Retimer, the host of the Ladies Talk Show. Thank you for being here. We have an unbelievable show. The show is called The Soul of Marriage. And we're here with a very, very special lady from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem. And she is here to talk to us today. Her name is Rebetzin Yehudis Golshevsky. Am I saying it right? You should. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. okay. Hold on. And let me see if I can get That's that. So You're the director of Shaviti. Yes. Let's see. There we go. Which is a, 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 a woman's education network. She teaches. In, it's a place she teaches in um, Jerusalem. It's your... You're the... That's me. That's your, that's your place, baby. right? That's and it's baby. also online. Here's the thing we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this, the spiritual reality going on in the world. What is, what is a soul? How does your soul to relate to your husband? We all heard the term soulmates. Like, oh, we're soulmates. You know, what does that mean? Like, you both like to go to the same uh, parks together. You like to eat at the same restaurants. What does soulmates actually mean? And how can we use this information and the reality as God created it? How can we use this reality to better our day-to-day -day married life? Stay tuned. This is going to be awesome. I'd like to welcome Rebetzin Golshevsky. Am I good? Okay, okay, okay. You did great, and I don't even like to go by Rabbit Singleshevsky because I, all my students for all these years, I just say, just call me Yehudis. We're friends. We're learning together. We're growing together. You know, we don't. I don't like the distance aspect of that. You know, the title. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Yehudis. Okay. So I just. Does that sound? Yehudis works. That's that's the easiest one. Okay. So the soul of marriage. You want me to start, or you have first? I want you to start. Yes, I want. Okay, so I, I want to. Actually, I think a lot of people are curious. What is a soulmate? What does it mean? Okay, so the truth is, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the whole concept of soulmates. You know, I'll tell you a story. It's a, actually it's like about 500 years old. This story. So there was a couple you that there. lived. Yeah, I wasn't there at the time, okay, but okay. I have heard about it. You know, I really was there. I remember it. Yes. <laughs> My soul is there. But the, the, it's a very famous story of the great mystic, the Arizal, who lived in Sfat about 500 years ago. And, um, and he, uh, he, a man came to him and he said, and, and it was part and parcel of his role there for the two years that he lived in Sfat. The Arizal only was there for two years. And um, people would come with all kinds of problems. So this, this gentleman came and he was beside himself. He had no shalom bite, no peace at home. The house was a disaster. He, all, everything that he said, his wife def just refused him. Anything that she said to him, he felt automatically mm. like he wanted to refuse her. And so they had an unending conflict, which was not resolvable. He went to the Ariza. And he wanted to know, not just, I mean, here we're talking about the soul of marriage. We're not talking about, about techniques. We're not talking about, um, you know, um, various approaches. We're talking about getting to the essence. Why is there conflict here? So he went into SRA. So and I just have to say, our, the Arizal, you have to just say, is a big was a great about 500 years yeah, ago. Yeah, he was a in great Israel, Jewish in mystic Sfat, in yeah. Sfat, which is in northern and we, Israel. People in are the still studying his books to yeah, this day. Yeah, and wow. he's like the, the fountain of Jewish mysticism over the last 500 years is rooted in his teachings. Mm -hmm. So everything that, whenever people go to classes and they hear all kinds of beautiful spiritual ideas, almost always the root of all those teachings that have been so popularized, everything having to do with Jewish, Jewish mysticism, also even teachings of Hasidut, of the whole Hasidic movement, all of that is really rooted in his work. Now he, he, he passed away quite young, but he was a towering figure, and people knew if they wanted to understand the root of their soul, what they're here to fix, why things are not working the way they are, they knew they could go to him. This man went to him and said, I am struggling at home. I, I, we cannot get along. And actually, in this particular case, which is, you know, you never know how it's going to look. When people are not getting along, you don't really know, also as an outsider, who's, like, is someone the instigator? Is it just that the, they're not able to work together? Is one party a little bit more responsible than the other? Who's carrying most of the emotional weight? And it's very hard to you know. talked to. If you talked to the of guy, course. it's all her fault. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I can only we say that this story, this story does not tell us about the story of the wife. 
it tells us the story about the husband. I'm just putting that as a little bit of an introduction. Caveat, yeah, it's a bit yeah, of yeah. a caveat because when we hear the story, we wonder what was going on on her end. Let's leave that aside for now. We're just looking at it from one perspective, okay. admittedly realizing that every story has more than one perspective on it. Yeah. So he goes to that result and he says, I'm, I, I feel like I'm dying. I can't go on like this. Mm. I, I can't breathe. My house is a, is a battlefield. What is going on? So the Arizal, you know, having the capacity to sort of see into the other man's soul and understand its needs and its history, because we're also talking about a story which involves reincarnations, which a lot of... I hate you to, could say that on here. I'm you allowed to say it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's been very big. So yeah, a, no, lot, a lot big of no, what appears to yeah, us yeah. as... A, a lot of what we experience in life as being sort of these, you know, like these in, undecipherable realities like this child was born wired like this this situation this relationship is wired like that how did it get to be like that and the answer is well you've kind of done this before mm -hmm. and you didn't resolve it then and now you have some opportunity now to resolve so he walks in and he says i cannot my, my life with my wife is impossible and the arizal said he said well actually you have to know the last time around you made her life a living hell. You really were terrible to her. And, and you have a lot to pay. You have really a great debt to pay. And in order to facilitate the fast repayment of this debt, she's giving you a very hard time. It's not just that at this point, because in this frame, it's as if she's the difficult one. But you should know, you were the difficult one. And the fact that you're suffering now in the relationship is related to the fact that you caused a lot of suffering earlier. So the man said, what do I do now? It's unbelievable. What I wish there was somebody do? like that we could go. Yeah, oh, exactly. What do I yes. do now? I wish we had that. Someone Everybody wishes. Someone. Everybody wants to be able to go to someone yeah. who's going to say, yeah. I can tell you where it's yeah. all rooted. Yeah. You know, but I'll tell you, Rabbi Nachman of Brussels says something very powerful. He said that Yisurim come from lack of da'at. I'm going to explain. Wait, I'm okay. going to translate. <laughs> that genuine suffering emerges from the place of lack of awareness. Like pain is pain. It's, it's visceral. You get it. You feel it. And it's quantifiable. Suffering can be can be without end in a certain sense because it's psychic it is an emotion it's something that's more internal and the way i like to talk about it is genuine suffering is a feeling of existential abandonment that means to say no meaning no why am i purpose. here why, why am i, why am I why going is through this, this happening to me why is this happening yeah. to me and so that feeling of aloneness in the picture of lack of an understanding lack of awareness of why is this going on that is actually the root of human suffering so, not so much the actuality of the pain mm -hmm. but the lack of awareness of the meaning of the pain now what that means practically speaking is that if we all had the insight to understand the meaning of our pain it would alleviate the greatest proportion of our suffering. But if the suffering is itself part of a process of healing that is necessary. So that's brilliant. Now I want to get back to the first story. I'm Let's go back to the well, story. You, I don't know you well enough to know if you will remember. I will remember. Okay, I go so all the way back. Don't worry. Let's go here for a second. Because I want to, how would one know, like you said, oh, as long as you understand what the meaning of it. What if I have, you know, a very, somebody near and dear to me who's had a, a back pain for yes. so many years. And, yes. the, you know, she's unbelievable. Like she, you know, um, her whole attitude about life and she's always, when she's good, she's like out there doing stuff for other people. Amazing human being yeah. but like why you know uh, okay why? so yeah. well, i'll give you okay. okay we took a jump out okay and then we'll go back okay let's everybody's gonna hold the thread yeah everyone's gonna, hold thread? Okay. They're live, by the way, Hi. 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 everyone's gonna keep with the thread okay. so we were talking about a story about a difficult marriage but we're talk to this out. camera because this one this that go disappears after 24 no hours problem. this is the one that gets so started. that so that we're following the thread and i'm gonna go back now I'll, I'll tell you a story about pain chronic pain i have an old friend known her for many many years who suffered from constant non-diagnosable, non-treatable pain. Some people said, oh, it's fibromyalgia, it's this, it's this. She was really, really suffering for a very mm. long number of years. Mm. Now, she also, it's a bit of a marriage story because she was also in, for quite a few years, in a very difficult marriage. In the end, she left that marriage. She left the marriage with three children and moved made a big shift and moved from the countryside in Israel. She was living in a kind of kibbutz, a co sort of moshav, a, a collective a settlement. And then she moved into Jerusalem, put her kids to a totally different framework of schools, totally changed her life, and also 
had to abandon her home in order to procure her divorce, mm. had to go into a state of complete financial um, insecurity. Her husband, the ex-husband, part of the release of the divorce, unfortunately, was that he abdicated. He said, I'll give you the divorce, but I am not taking financial responsibility for any of this. And so she was on her own. Now, she suffered pain prior to this, but afterwards her pain became very, very terrible. Now, this, I met her when her youngest daughter was about four, I would say. All three children now are married and have beautiful, beautiful families. And she raised them as a single mother in the Hasidic world in Jerusalem without any family connections because she was a newcomer into that life, and so she didn't have a support network. She is and an she intensely. Had back pain or whatever pain she was in the, constant pain, yeah, yeah. and also had great stress over her financial situation. Her children are beautiful, well-adjusted, unbelievable adults, living wonderful lives, and and and, and over the years we have had so many conversations, uh, trying to support her and be supportive of her and help her through the actuality of her unresolvable pain. Daily pain. So one day I was talking to her on the phone, and I said, and like a thought came to me. I said, you know, we know each other so many years, but this never occurred to me before, but let's float it as a theoretical, all right? I'm not saying it's the answer. I'm saying let's entertain a thought for a minute. You're a balachuva. You were not raised observant. You raised your children through a, a road that I have seen many people who came from much more secure backgrounds with much more resources at their disposal who did not come out with children in a spiritually thriving, emotionally thriving state that you managed. Wow. Every factor appears to be, in, that went into the raising of this family, appeared to have been really dead set against getting the result that you got. Now here, let's, let's talk tachlis. Let's get down to business. If someone had said to you all those years back, I'm going to make you a trade. I'm going to give you something that actually isn't coming to you, so to speak. Something impossible. That you're going to walk out of the marriage, of financial insecurity, of physical pain, of all of that, you're going to walk out with three diamonds. But you have to pay in suffering. Would you pay it? Would you have paid it if you knew? Mm. I, I look, we're good. I know. I, know. Witness. Good, good, I also good have them. Oh I'm t I'm say, I, I said that you're on the phone. We're good enough friends. I could say something like that. I said, let's entertain that possibility for just a minute. I don't have any answer to why you have to go through what you went through or what you're going through. But let's just entertain that possibility just for a second. If you could do it all over again, but knowingly, I'm trading away my own body, its health, its pain-free state, it's proper functioning, in order to come out of this story of my life with these diamonds, if you had to make that trade, would you do it? And she said, in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. In a heartbeat. She and I said, said chills. She said chills. I said, she in a heartbeat. She said, in a heartbeat. And I said, okay, now I don't have Ruach HaKodesh. I don't have any kind of divine inspiration or prophecy, but I have to tell you something. I would assume that something similar actually took place because it doesn't make sense that you came out with these three. It doesn't make sense that you succeeded in what is basically the most important endeavor of your life. My arguably. friend, my friend has three kids. I'm telling her this. Wow. I'm actually going to have her watch the show. By the way, this and they woman, are diamonds. after wow. having married off the three children and gone through another marriage, failed, another failed marriage, mm -hmm. she finally met someone who is actually... A perfect, wonderful partner, and she no longer suffers her pain. Wow. And that was not because of medical interventions. She finished her tikkun. She finished whatever. What, how do you say tikkun? There was a spiritual repair that needed to be done, and clearly that's done. She has maybe other things to do now. Presumably, if you're alive, you have work to do. Hmm. But that bit... So it's like, okay, everyone's with me? Okay, okay, okay now let's, let's go, go back. back. There we 500, <laughs> let's, 500 years in the past, we go back to that result, and he says to this man, last time around, you were the bad guy. This time around, you have to pay the debt. So she's giving you a, an, an objectively, she's running you a very objectively difficult life. So the man said, what am I supposed to do with this? 
So he said, you go home. And Wait, he accepted it? Like, if someone yes. told me that, I would say to the RSL, like, come on, she's the one who said this. She's the one who did that. No. No, 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 no. It comes from the RSL. Yeah, maybe. I okay. think what happens, okay. Okay. we okay. don't even okay. understand okay. that. Okay. And that's why I said we would like to have such people. Go we would love to have such right. people, access to them. So he and why do, people, why do people run to, why do people run to mystics and to, you know, this Kabbalists and this and that? Because they're looking for that kind of an answer. But he was somebody who you knew he was telling yeah. the truth. Yeah. So very rarely do you find someone whose voice, the voice coming out of them is so clearly the voice of Hashem, the voice of God, that, that it was just undeniable to him. So he said, what do I do? The Arizal told him, he said, go home, make no waves. Anything that she does that's difficult for you, you accept. Accept it and know in your mind, she is repairing your soul. And as she repairs your soul... You're thankful to her. Now, again, this is a difficult story because we look at the situation from the outside and she was abusive to him. Okay? And so I don't want people to walk away saying if somebody is in an abusive relationship, then God forbid they just write it out. She's my ticket. That's a different... Okay, I, I, I want to be careful. I'm telling the yeah. story. It's a powerful and important story. You have to be careful with the use of the story. Very good. Very okay, good. So, so, so how do you be he careful went with home. the use of this story? I'm going to tell you how it resolves. So no, he goes, yeah, no, but I also want to know how they can be careful. Uh, okay, so we go home. he goes home, and she's still giving him a hard time, and he says, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Whatever you say, like, dear. What did you do with my husband? Okay, so <laughs> she, exactly. She's very, very confused <laughs> because in order to have... In order for conflict to really remain conflict, yeah. you need two conflicting parties. When one person stops being involved in conflict, it destabilizes the relationship. Things change. Sometimes they get very weird. Sometimes the other person sort of gets the picture and starts to come along. It can be, but that destabilization happens when you have a certain kind of structure or mechanism where both parts of the mechanism are used to working in a certain way, when one it's kind moves of a habit. out... We talk yeah. about that a lot. Too. When one part of that equation pulls out, the other party doesn't quite know where their footing is, and that can be a big adjustment. So he's saying, yes, dear, yes, dear. He's obviously okay with it, and she's getting confused. So she's suspicious, like he's, mm -hmm. like he's being... Like maybe he's being facetious. Like maybe he's teasing Caging me. Like maybe he's, he's, he's got yeah, he's manipulating me. It's a setup. It's a setup. Yeah. It's a yeah. Set up. yeah. <laughs> so then she doesn't quite believe it, but it keeps on going on, and he's really holding strong with it. And finally, finally, she says something is going on here, and she starts to wheedle him. You know, like you you went to the rav, you went to the rabbi. What did he say? Um, did he tell you something? And he. Is not saying anything because as he left the rabbi, if he, as he left Arizal, Arizal said, "It's your work to do. You don't get so." So finally, she pushes and pushes until finally he just unloads and he said, "I went to the rabbi and he told me that you are repairing my soul." And she said, "Watch this." She said, "I'm repairing your soul. You can forget it if all of my." Difficulty with you is good for you. From now on, I'm only going to be very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only going to be really nice. And he's, he doesn't know what to do with it. She's like, that's it. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. If, because you understand, she's yes. so full of resentment and yes. anger against him, which she can't even really necessarily even explain. Yes. Now, Bidafka, she doesn't want to heal his soul, so she's going to be nice. This goes on for a while. She just lets everything go. She doesn't fight with him. She doesn't argue with him. He says, yes, dear. She says, yes, dear. Everything feels great. Everything's fine. It's peaceful at home. Now the man goes back to that result. Guess what? He, you can imagine what he says. Where's my tikkun? Where's my, like, That's now where am I left here? If she's being so nice and, and all of the friction, like, think about it like this, this friction between these two souls banging against each other is like, it's an act of polishing. It's an act of refinement. She's no longer conf she's no longer in conflict with me. How am I going to come to my soul repair? She's not an obstacle anymore. Like in other words, now now it's the game game over. Game like over. I, so I the Ariz so the Arizal said to him, "No, that's fine. You finished this. You finished that repair. Now you can go home and live in peace. Wow. You 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 did what you had to do. It's okay. Now you go home. Now, so." The whole that story beautiful, yay! Uh, no, no, no. We like the we like the happy good, endings. Good, we yeah, love the happy yeah, endings. Yeah, yeah. But it's really there's like the whole perspective on. Uh, this is what we were doing this morning. We had a class this morning about this concept of all my relationships, everything in my life. 
I'm there really with God. God is speaking to me and educating me for my relationships with other people. And when and, and especially, especially with marriage, because you know, we had spoken about this like the great sage of the Chofetz Chaim, Rav Yisrael Meir Kagan, he he said all relationships exist in kind of concentric circles. In, 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 you know, until you get to the inner place. You know, you have all these people, like you have, you know, people you see it, like you see them in events, you know, they live down in the, the grocery, sh- store, grocery store, whatever, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, mothers, you see a PTA, like you don't really have anything to do with it. And then you have like a, a closer, more inner circle. And those are people you have a little bit more, you know, you've got neighbors and you've got, you know, friends, but not close friends. And so on. you keep going closer and closer to the inside. Now, one of the paradoxes of life is that it's really easy to be in a great relationship with the people in the outer circles, mm-hmm. it's very, it's increasingly more difficult to be in a great relationship with the people in the innermost circles, like your husband, husband. your <laughs> children, Hello. Hello. Yeah. your yeah. husband, your children, your parents, your. Tell the story about the single woman who just got married or something. Oh. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait, and I also don't want to miss. Wait, okay, come to that. I, I don't. How, do <laughs> how they long avoid, are we doing this? How, how <laughs> do they avoid the abuse? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, we have to be careful with stories like that. There are a lot of stories like that circulating. Right, right. And so we say, is this something, first of all, it's interesting because the fact that it's the husband who's on the receiving end in that particular story is very instructive. One of the reasons why is because paradynamics in relationships, like, it's very, you know, times have changed. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same sometimes. So paradynamics in relationships also, at least, and especially at that time, um, Physically, financially, socially, the upper hand was always assumed to be in the hand of the man, yeah. which is why we would assume the assumption in Jewish law is that, is that if a woman wants to be divorced, right, if she wants, the presumption actually is that she probably has a pretty good reason to do so, mm-hmm. whereas the likelihood of a husband wanting to divorce his wife could be that he's not suffering, but he just wants something new. So that's that was an that was a that was an assumption in Jewish life and Jewish law for quite a long time. So when we saw a situation where he's the suffering party, where ostensibly if he wanted to, he could divorce her, right? And actually when he went to the Arizal, that's probably part of the question. Should I divorce Should I just her? divorce yeah. her? Because in that time especially, it's not that difficult to summarily, fairly summarily divorce her. Give her again. Why do you have to suffer? So the fact that he is coming from the place, the, the, the story being from one side, in a way, has, is very instructive. Because we're working on the assumption that he could easily liberate himself from the situation. Mm-hmm. And why didn't he? So and no, why so, didn't right. he? No, so you're saying that if a person can liberate themselves, yeah, that's general, called abuse. I wouldn't, I'm, not, I'm not quantifying or, or, or giving a name as to what's abuse, what's not. But in that particular story, there are some details that are important to bear in mind. Right. Presumably because of the social conditions and the legal conditions of that time, if he had wanted to escape from the situation, he could easily have done exactly. so. Very often what we're looking at when we're dealing with couples is this, you know, the situation where actually she would like to get out, but she really can't get out. But she's, right. you know, like the, yeah, the entanglement trapped. is from yeah, yeah. a different yeah. end. So that's why I'm just saying that you have to be, as far as the idea that's in the story, the core of it is just the perspective of my marriage is the main, that's the inner, inner, inner concentric circle. And at that point, it's not even a circle. It's just a unity. There's not a circle there. There's just me and my husband. And, um, and at that, and at that innermost point, um, that's where the real work is being done, you know, and that's why all the blessing comes from there being peace there. Like when things are good, they're good. That's the thing about marriage. It's like when it's difficult, no, there, there's almost nothing that is as painful as a marriage that's not working the way it should. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. There's almost nothing as glorious and as, as delightful right. as a marriage that is working well. And 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 when it's so like, tell the story about the single lady. Oh, okay. right. yeah. By the way, you got loved, loved, loved it. They love that story. That's mm. so cute. We do have you one get feedback question. straight away. Oh, we yeah. have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. That, does that mean that your um, bashert, your soulmate, soulmate? soulmate 
um, was the same one that you had in a past life. Okay, very good. So I, I actually started off by Wait, saying... Wait, you have to tell the single thing. I will. Okay. I have there's so many. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the, the, um, the, I said at the beginning that there are some misconceptions about this whole business about soulmates. Leia had said, oh, does that mean you like to go to the same park? Does that mean you like to... I mean, you both like to ski. You both like, you both like to surf. You both like that. Whatever. So is that the essence of soulmate? So the essential definition of soulmate means the person who is in on the spiritual plane, in meaning in your root, the root of you, the root of him, that you are best suited with this person to come to the fulfillment of the purpose of your existence. Say that again. Wait That's a second. A soulmate. Guys, get your notebooks out. <laughs> Write this down. Can I remember the exact <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. This is the person with whom you have the best ability to reach the purpose of your existence. Now, the purpose of our existence is very interesting because a person might say, look, I was born to write books, right? I was born to do this. I was born, I could be born to do a lot of things. The truth is every single soul comes down into the world. We can do a lot of things in the world. There might be a lot of ways of accomplishing things or doing things in the world, but ultimately, just like all of the world, let's also say all the mystics, was only created, the entire universe was created in only in order to reveal God's attributes in the most refined fashion, in the highest fashion. So too is the person, the individual soul, does it descend into the world in order to reveal all of its attributes, its qualities, its characteristics, its potentialities in the highest fashion. Now, sometimes... So then that's called shlemus, which we call perfection of the soul. To come to wholeness. To come to wholeness and that it should be revealed. So that's one of the paradoxes of our life. Is like, I could be out there in the world doing a lot. I could be, I don't know, let's say I work in the emergency room. I'm seeing a million patients a day. I'm saving lives. I'm doing... And that's a very, very important thing to be doing. And then I go home, right? And I could be brought into this kind of like a challenge that seems like it's so, so small. I have another soul... When I, t when I work with students who are struggling a little bit in their marriages, I say the essence, one of the essences of marriage is that you have someone else's soul in your hands. Mm. The other person's mm. nefesh is in your hands. That other person's under soul the is in it's your that, hands. It's given over. I don't remember the source. But it, in, in, under the chuppah, your husband's hand is put in. The exactly. Hand. You're the other mm. person's soul. I am, why, and what is the implication of that? If he says something to me that doesn't sit well with me, it hurts. If I say something harsh to him, it hurts. It does something. I, I could go to the grocery store and somebody could say something to me, I blow it off. Why? Because that person's not there in with me at the place where I am at the place where I have to fulfill the purpose of my existence. So everything is very, very delicate. I have someone else's soul in my hand. I have someone else's heart in my hand. Those are, these are, that's a responsibility. When I tell my students, you're getting married, pay, bear in mind. It's not just about relationship. You have someone, you have the, we call this the tzipor nefesh. It's like a delicate mm -hmm. bird that you take into like this beautiful little, you know, I don't know, the most delicate of delicate birds comes and sits in your hand. It could be crushed. It could be dropped. It could be harmed. Mm -hmm. And you're holding it, not because the other person is a piece of, you know, fine glass and they're so delicate, but because we're talking about the internality of someone else's life. A person who's not happy at home goes out into the world also unhappy, deals with their children unhappy, goes to work unhappy, goes to be in the community unhappy. and But where is all the action really taking place? Here, right there at the middle where all the work is really being done. But so then why, why is it then that if your husband is your soulmate, right, and you have his soul in your hands, why is it that you can feel that caring like of a bird when you're holding your newborn baby in your hand it's instantaneous yes you will never harm this thing because this child is everything to you and it's so clear and, it's and your husband you. yeah. you're like okay i'm dropping you <laughs> like, like, it, but you just answered your own question what? sorry i'll I tell did. you why yeah <laughs> the stuff that comes easy is not the fulfillment of the purpose of your existence nothing that comes i have a friend okay I'm not wearing makeup, Did you right? Hear that, that yeah. I'm gonna say it. Hold on a second. I don't wear makeup. It's like a pretty easy example. I have a friend in Yerushalayim. Great stand, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, mommy. Thank you so much. <laughs> so the but the um, 
the uh, the oh, so I don't wear makeup, you know. So and like I never wore makeup. I have a friend in Yerushalayim who wears a lot of makeup. She's like, I feel really good when I'm wearing makeup. I love makeup. Everywhere I go, I go out of the country, I go to the duty free, I buy makeup. You're like, that's, you know, she loves her makeup, right? And she's into it. And she always feels guilty about it. Why? Because she's read all of these different articles and things about how makeup, it's not modest, it's not this, it's not that. She's got a lot of guilty feelings about it. I sit there with her, I'm like, listen, sweetheart. There's nothing wrong with your makeup. Relax. It's fine. <laughs> wear your makeup. Enjoy your makeup. She said, but you don't wear makeup. And I said, that's not for my part. That's not righteousness. That's not holiness. It's because I don't like makeup. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like how it feels. I don't feel myself in it. It's just not me. It's not me. So I said, it's for me, for very good. Mm -hmm. I said, you're looking at me as if you're me. And you're thinking, if I was to go out in the street with my face on, you know, blank, I'd feel uncomfortable. I'd have right. to overcome something. And I said, for you, it might be deep spiritual work, deep emotional work for right. you to go out without your makeup or even with less than you're wearing. For me, it has nothing to do. It's, it, there's not, there's, it's I have work, not an right? iota. If you would want to think that it's a mark in my favor, which I, I'm not convinced that it is. But if it is, it's not. It's no mark in my favor because it's not something that I have wow. to overcome. Spirituality is exactly the opposite of this world. In this world, everything counts only by what you see. An accomplishment is only called an accomplishment when you have a tangible result, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way it works in this world. In spirituality, that's not the way it is. In the soul, we say, lifum tsara agra. In accordance with the effort, that's the reward. That means if I must overcome myself, that's where I'm really doing something. Now, so let's say... That you I'm can't the, see, just to be clarified. Exactly. It, it, I don't necessarily see it. And sometimes there's no observable result. Not that it's small, but it's... So I go out and let's say I go to the emergency room. I'm treating patients all day. Everybody claps. I've saved lives. Everybody's clapping. I go home. My husband says something to me a little bit that doesn't suit me. And I get... And I say, why would you say that? Or whatever. I'm reactive. And I'm not even attentive to the fact that perhaps he said that, you know, he has his own reasons maybe why he's feeling a little bit pressured, feeling a little bit anxious, feeling why, why, why maybe it's, it felt like he was saying something a little bit out of turn. So for me to just wait, oh, there's the duct tape. The duct tape, yes, yeah. yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. I'm not going to duct tape, yeah. never mind, that you notice. Yeah. For me to just yeah. schweig, yeah, yeah, to yeah, just yeah, yeah. stop, not react, yeah. we'll say not be reactive, that is something that takes how long? Five seconds, 10 seconds, less, right? For me to just pause. And that's what deserves the standing ovation. Exactly. Oh, that's what deserves it. But that's the deceptive nature of this world. That's what's called not living in the place of the soul of the marriage. The mm. soul of the marriage is on the inside. The inside is really where the work is being done. A lot of times the work is very, does not bear with it tangible results. What it is, is a very, very private moment, even an instant, that I have actually between myself and my creator. Of, I don't need to react. I, I have the other person's nefesh, the other person's soul is bound up with me. I'm, you know, I deal with couples who are in crisis. I, I, I sometimes I just sit there and I'm like, listen, the world did not blow up just because you have not yet learned to communicate properly with each other. You like, no one is going anywhere. Great. Just yeah. sit down a second. Okay, you, you lack certain tools and perspectives. They're actually not that complex. It's not that difficult to implement them, but you're missing them. Today I went to teach this morning, and a woman came over to me. And she said to me, I'm so, I, I know that you were very involved in a whole story of somebody's marriage um, and that they're doing really well now. And I said, you know, it's very interesting how... Some people could look at a situation and say, kaput. And actually, I was so, when, when these people came to me already quite a long time ago, I said, who's been involved with you now? Meaning, who have you gone to? And you've well, been... This third party, like a therapist or yeah, a rabbi. Yeah, third party, or rabbi, whatever. Mm -hmm. They'd been through the gamut. Like, they'd been all over the place. And they really were on the verge of collapse, and they were about to get divorced. And I, I said, listen, the world hasn't blown up yet, right? Like... Nothing's happened. Why are we in such a rush to... Why, why are we, okay, so let's oh, just take a step so back. Rushed. Let's just take a step back from the brink and take a look at the perspective, not just for the sake of, oh, stay in it, stay in it, you know, be patient. I'm like, no, 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 you have problems. You've got some serious problems. <laughs> There's some stuff here that <laughs> really needs to be fixed. No, no, yes. you, have, you have some serious stuff here. It's not going to go away by itself. But that doesn't mean that you can't 
um, it's not even a question of resolution. It's more like, for me, I took a look at, I just, I would talk to her, I would talk to him, and then I just observed them together. And I said, these people just don't have a clue. They got married and just, either because of the family that they came from, because of the influence that they had, the teachers, whatever it is, some basic, basic, the groundwork of what is this marriage for? What are so our roles? So why don't you roles? tell our listeners what you, what the what are we? Oh, the kind for? of ste- or Leia, Leia, steps that we buy go the through. marriage secrets book. Buy yeah, the yeah, marriage secrets book. I, really I haven't read it. Yeah, the like the basics. We're still missing. We're still missing the the um, uh, story about the single. From oh my God! <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, well, okay, <laughs> okay. okay. We'll keep them all. You're keeping okay. the thread. So, okay. So she said to me. She said. So this young lady who came over to me said, "I'm so happy to see that they're thriving," and I said, "You know." It's like they were the elements that they were missing are not pieces that you can gain immediately. They require a certain amount of work and investment and commitment. Communication. But they are not. Yeah. But, they, but they are not like impossible. impossible. They're right. not impossibilities. Right. Right. And you know what I would tell them? Yeah. You can always get divorced. Mm. You can. And actually, what I told them was something even a little bit pushier than that. Mm. I said, "Listen, neither of you have the right tools in place to have happy marriages." Mm. What are you going to do? Go make another two people's lives miserable? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get divorced Hello. and it's like a fish and it's like yeah. the cell splits and then it goes, keeps yeah. on proliferating. Yeah. You have a problem here at the court. And actually, I felt very strongly. There are Zivug, soulmates. Right. Wow. There was like something in them. I said, I, I, to me, absolutely, no question. You're, wow. you're, you're, a, you're a pair, but you don't have the tools to be able to work well as a pair. So mm-hmm. in terms of the bottom line, the first thing I started with, you know, when you get married, this amazing, wondrous thing happens. It's possible to be very adversarial because whenever you have two souls together in proximity and friction with each other, they each have different egos and different purposes and different, and so they tend to, so it's very normal yeah. about anything to have a lot of friction. You get married and essentially what happens is you are on the same side in the big picture. It's like the whole world is outside. You're going to have financial pressures to deal with. You're going to have children to deal with. You're going to have mortgages together and losses and gains. More money, less money. Better health and worse health. You'll get old. The body that you married is not the body that you're going to bury. Mm. Right? Presumably. Mm. And so over the long, long life of a marriage, and hopefully it has many, many years, Decades and decades, and and it then and also it's sequelae is like the lives of your children's What's sequelae? marriages. What's sequelae? sequelae? like the the second level. <laughs> She's been using a Stop lot me. of Stop words, me. and I'm like, I need the dictionary. Sequelae, S E Q, right? Uh-huh. Sequelae are are the secondary results of something, like a sequence the outcome. Or outcome. Oh, okay, fine. So so the second the further results of that is like your children's marriages, your grandchildren's mm-hmm. marriages. Mm-hmm. So all that the you're talking the further ramifications yeah. it's like it's generational it's big mm-hmm. and so you get married and you say that there's this whole world outside right we have a lot of things that we're going to have to contend with but actually the biggest gift in a certain way in the marriage is that i have someone an ally a partner mm-hmm. with whom i am journeying through this very very like rough, this, rough, these terrain. rough terrain of my yeah. life we are no longer i am not a person navigating the terrain of my life alone i am with someone he has resources that i don't have i possess resources that he does not have together we can do things that are not possible for each of us alone and as we bolster each other and learn to work together that's called a happy productive live marriage which changes evolves we learn from mistakes right. we have periods where we're like a little bit it's like, like okay the you know like the Sorry, I beginning is like okay. I'm married now 10 years, 20 years. I just had my 25th anniversary. I had 25th yeah, anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very brush and very sweet. So it's like okay, we're 25 years in, right? I'm looking back and saying, wow, we learned so much. We like went through so much. It's amazing. And at the outset, you take like two, you know, I, I forgot which of the great Hasidic Rebbe said, the sword of marriage, I think it was the Kotsk, a great Rebbe, great, great. Spiritual master, he said. He said, marriage is such a lofty, lofty thing. It's a shame they put over into the hands of little children. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Tell a story about the single lady. Okay. okay. And by so, the way, before you just say that, that is why so many of these divorced women mm -hmm. say that, that they feel like they're going at life alone. Yeah. With all the, everything in life that they have to now deal with, yeah. they're doing it alone. Well, they hear that. Because go back to that couple. That. Yeah. I go back to that couple when they said they had a lot of the source of their strife was financial. I said, oh, it's so much cheaper to be divorced. <gasps> Yeah, That's no what it says all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's so yeah, much cheaper to now have to deal with two households instead of yes. one household. Yeah, yeah, no, and the whole issue that she talked about, a lot of women say, I've just be there's somebody else out there. I married the wrong guy. This is it. You know, I just and, and I'm like, no, no, no. You have to understand whatever dysfunction you have in the marriage right now, it's going right into the other thing. Only now you'll be married to the guy who you didn't have your children with, right? You've got a different father. Now you've got those whole issues of awkwardness and the whole family Look, sometimes relationship. Sometimes there's a mitzvah. If a marriage is not viable, there is a mitzvah to divorce. It, it, it's yeah. true. Yeah. So it's sort of like, okay, we know that there is a possibility that sometimes a marriage is not viable or it becomes not viable. And so there is a possibility of closure. It's very interesting. But hold on a sec. Unless you have spent one solid year with a qualified third yeah. party, a yeah. therapist, a rebbitzin, a rabbi, a clergyman, somebody, and you have really given it your all. Oh, my husband doesn't want to come. I hear that. You go yourself. They will teach you how to get your husband in. Now, again, when you're going to get a third party, many times you have to try this person, eh, that person, eh, and then you get to the third person, and you're like, oh, my gosh, where have you been all my life? They teach you how about self-esteem. They teach you about communication. They teach you about all the things that you need to know to make the marriage work. If you have done that for a solid year and it's still not working, then you can have that conversation. But before you've done that, it's kind of like you're throwing in the towel. You're, you're, you're talk about the financial disaster. Talk about now you've got two households, right? You've got two washing machines you have to buy or rent or whatever. You, the, 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 the implications for that, people always think the grass is, the divorced grass is greener. We actually, we even think of doing a show of marriage advice from divorced women. Like, hello. There's a joke like, like, like this. Like, right? You know? Leah, there's a joke. In, in your shalom, we say, a man, uh, there was a husband and a wife, they couldn't get along. So after many years and many years of struggle and struggle, he finally said, okay, that's it. We're just going to divorce. They go to the Beit and they go to the court, and they, he gives her the divorce. They leave the court together. They're not fighting. They just can't, like, it's not working. They, they leave the court together, and then he looks at her as they step out, and he says, you want to get married? So she's like, we just sign the papers, you know, like, we're done. Hello. And he said, for a first wife, you were terrible, but for a second wife, you're pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> ouch, okay. ouch, I've not seen that one coming. That's your shalmim. You're always the whole time okay. you're on the thing about the single. I don't even remember what the story. I remember is, what the okay, story. Is. Okay, so okay, so but wait. let's get back to soul. It's just the idea of soul of marriage. Wait, right? you're doing the single. Wo I am. Okay, I'm getting okay. there. Yes. So I'm like getting the single there. woman story. So, yeah. Okay. So I this. It's not just her. It's like it's stuff that comes up. So she. Thank you so much. So um so uh, 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 a young woman who you know married not terribly long. She um, she was talking to me about how things... I asked her, how are things really going? I haven't seen you since before you got married. I haven't had a chance to talk to you. You know, you're a year in, let's say. Um, how's it going? And she starts telling me, it's like, I feel like I've been living... Well, I'm not going to use her exact language. It's been difficult. Let's that way. It's been challenging. She told me last night. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I said, okay... Okay, and then as she's sort of unburdening herself and telling me how things seem to be getting a little bit better and so on. And meanwhile, I hear it like with a kind of diagnostic ear of the but way she's But she was talking. saying how great she was before. Exactly. Yeah, right. So she said, oh, one before, thing I don't understand, right. one thing I don't understand is like right before I got married, I felt like for a while before I got married, I was really in a good groove. I felt like I really was in touch with myself. I was fulfilling my potential. I felt close to God. I felt like everything was in place. And I got married and it's like, crash crash it wasn't was it not what i was expecting so i said we got well, a newlywed here you got to be careful <laughs> no 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 it's okay it's okay she's gonna get it because yeah. when you're newly married you realize what's going on mm -hmm. so she so she said and it was like crash and i thought i thought it was a here i'll give you the example i thought i was a patient person i found out how impatient i am i thought i was a tolerant person i discovered that i'm very intolerant i thought i was a considerate person i discovered how inconsiderate i can be i said that's great 
that's great. <laughs> she said, what do you mean that's great? I was doing better before. I said, no, you were not doing better before. You didn't have a relationship that was close enough proximity for you to do the work that was essential to the fulfillment of your purpose of your existence. Mm. And so everything is very illusory. Like I get along with my friends, I get along with my sister, I get along yeah. with this one. Why? Because they are circles and they may be closer and closer, but they're not, they're in with me. And it's not in. I told, I, 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 this is something that people don't know. You have in, in, the, in the Jewish framework, right? In the Torah framework, there's a term in the Torah for your spouse. A man's wife is called She'er Besarol. It means the remnant of his flesh. Wow. Part of his body. And we have, and there are, by the and way... that's the rib. I mean, they should understand Yes, that, you know. yes, but it's much more than that. She'er Besarol means there's not, in many halachic, in many Torah legal um, contexts, there are things that a husband can do for a wife that go beyond being able to do something as a proxy for somebody else. You are not a proxy for your wife. A man is not a proxy for his wife in many instances because she's not considered to be a separate person from him. Wow. Now, people get touchy about it because they're like, I'm a separate person. Yes, yes, we know. You went to university. You have a master's degree. I you're very accomplished. I, I, I get it. A little t a, a side story. Of this is so gorgeous. Like uh, when I got my sons in law, I, I love them so dearly and clearly and whatever. And I went to the rub and I said, you know, I've been lighting c candles for all of my children or whatever. And I love my sons in law so much. And I feel so close to them. I really feel like I want to light candles for them. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're on Friday night. I feel very close to God and I'm davening and I'm, you know, whatever. I, I really feel like there's a missing. He said, Mrs. Richheimer, Mrs. Richheimer, you've been lighting a candle for them the whole time. That wow. the soul Why? is there. Meaning that one candle. The, the candle, candle that for her for is there. It's together. It's together. That's it. Yeah. So, so when, so, so what was I saying? Ah, so you thought beforehand that you were in a good place. And what did you discover that you're not? You didn't discover something new. Hashem, God is revealing to you the places where you need to the work via the specific soul who has the capacity to catalyze you into the work that you need to what do. What is catalyze? Okay, here. <laughs> to spark you, to spark you, to motivate you. Hello? I into know, I was, you know, yeah, right, okay. Catalyze. Yeah, it means to do like a kind a of reach. Do you know what a cobbler is? Do you know what a cobbler is? I do. Okay, fine. Okay. Oh, you, you see? see? She knows also there's the cobbler. There's two different kinds of cobblers. There's the guy who does the shoes and there's a cake. It's a cake. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Oh, she oh, got okay. a cake. I'm yeah, an editor. I'm a writer. Cobbler. I've written a whole bunch of books. I've also written a lot of books. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah but an apple okay, cobbler, we'll that's we'll good. Yeah. Because you cobble it together. You you should just know that I say that a lot of times to people. When I first got married, I thought Shana Rishona, the first year, I thought was supposed to be idyllic and like amazing and it was supposed to be roses and perfect and I literally I was all busy with my engagement so I didn't have time to process anything and then I get married and literally the morning after I turn over and I look at this person next to me and I started crying I'm talking about like a baby in hysterics and he wakes up to a crying mess <laughs> and he literally said he thought like does she have a mental illness I know about? Is there something I'm missing? I'm, this isn't so He's like, are you happy? And I couldn't even express to him that I'm looking at him saying, this is going to be life. It's worse than a prison sentence because at least there you get time off for good behavior. You maybe can like be out. Yeah. Here you're stuck for like, and I had to suddenly come to terms with like, this, this is, is it. Perfect. This is it. This and is I my didn't guy. have, and I just felt like everyone thought, oh, it's just going to be perfect. And nobody explained to me that here's another person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a very hard. It's an adjustment. Yeah. I hard. tell the new, new uh, mothers also the same thing. I say, look, I was saying, oh, isn't this the happiest time in your <laughs> life? You look, oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is really going to be the happiest. <laughs> I was yeah. Yeah. 80 blue yeah. thoughts like common I, fantasy I, with love yeah. blocks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, also, I, mean, I was just talking about something. After we had the class, I was like, I remember when when I married off my daughter, that um, that whole first week afterwards, I was like, at every Shever Brachas, at the whole week of celebration afterwards, I'd see them every day. I'm like, my antenna are right. Yes. <laughs> like, is she happy? How are they acting with each other? What's the body language? Like, I'm, I'm just like looking to see. I want to be sure she's feeling okay, but I also can't ask about how she's doing too much. And so... 
You know, but it is definitely an adjustment, no question. Yeah. I have a very good... Okay, we have to wrap we up. Wrap up. Soon, so so just to end this things. just yeah. to end this off, because it kind okay. of like closes. Yeah. You asked about the Bashar. I gave you the yes. soulmate. Yeah. I gave you an answer. The truth is there's many levels to the concept of soulmate. And I'm not going to go there. Maybe it goes in a book sometime. But it's not... Um, there are different levels of soulmate discussed in the Kabbalistic works. And 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 um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pr- touch on that, but it's something it's to think heavy. about. It's too, for, deep. too big. Too deep, yeah. But we'll say that's the person with whom you really can do the work. Now I have just a close up. I'm a very good friend who is a therapist and who runs a fa- uh, therapist um, training institute in Jerusalem. I'm gonna Sue Kagan. If anybody knows Sue. Um, so. Anyway, so she's wonderful. Many many years ago, before she was in that business, you know, before she had really started that, maybe almost thirty years ago, she said to my sister. Um, she said to my sister, when my sister was in, uh, you know, like going through the process of looking for her husband. So she said, you know, this is the way it works. When you meet somebody, you have your, like your list of criteria that are very important to you. And so I, you say at the end of the day, you say I married this guy for reasons A, B, C, and D. and all those reasons are actual. They're real. They're not illusions. And then you get married, and you're like. Oh, I think actually I married him for reasons like W, X, Y, and Z. Meaning, I had a purpose so for putting us together that was not obvious to me. Now, what's the relationship between your A, B, C, D, and your W, X, Y, and Z? Please tell us. They appear to be so far from each other. She didn't elaborate on this, but it's something I've given a lot of thought to over the years. It's like this. If I didn't have really good, solid reasons for entering into the relationship, I would never go there. If I knew ahead of time the kind of process that I would have to go through of growth that is waiting for me together with this person, I might be intimidated and I might not do it. So what what does God do on the soul level? He gives me ample reasons, ample reasons to marry this person. And he presumably also has ample reasons to marry me. And then guess what? We go home and we wake up in the morning (laughs) and discover that day crying, but wake up in the morning that actually the actuality of, of life with the other person, mm-hmm. all that A, B, C, and D was not an illusion. It's there, but actually, oh, I am such an intolerant person. I am an impatient person, and my husband needs a lot of space and time to come to decisions. Wow. And I think mismatch, and the answer is, uh-uh, match. Wow. Match, why? He needs to take into consideration the fact that there are people who need to have things done at a certain pace. Like, he's got to adjust to me, and I also must adjust to him. And, and in that place of the work of where I am needing to move and where he needs to move, the place where we start to meet, you know, where we come together in our adjustments, in our efforts, which show not necessarily so much external accomplishment. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't just, mm-hmm. but in, internally, Internal the overcoming of self, yeah. the transcendence of self, in order to create something larger than ourselves, that's called the soul of marriage. Wow. Got Yay. it? Thank you. Okay. So it actually said so resonates. Wow. Yeah. Growth at its core. Thank you Amazing. very much. Great. Growth this at its core. Is Leia Retire with our wonderful, wonderful Revitson. Yes. Yes. Yehudas. 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 It's yes. good. Fine. You guys are like okay. soulmates. That's, okay. <laughs> that's very good. Very Thank you so much for joining us. I told us. you it was going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> we do great. Thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. We'll see you next time.